is uh, great to be here. Thanks to organizers for inviting me to give the opening talk. Uh, this talk is supposed to uh, be um, the open the whole conference and put the uh, theme of the conference in context. So um, I'm not going to present the new results, but instead I'm going to tell you what is it that what we do uh, as far as studying the uh, origin of life and its existence somewhere else and uh, how that will unify all of us sitting over here. Uh, we all have come from different fields. Uh, I'm a planetary dynamicist. Uh, we have galaxy astronomers sitting there. We have biologists. We have ethicists. Uh, um, all the, you are all coming here uh, because of one common theme, one common denominator. Somehow you are working on the origin of life. Somehow you are working on whether life exists elsewhere in the universe. And that is what um, brings all of us together. So, uh, when I was asked by organizing committee to uh, give the opening talk, I said to myself, what would be a talk that not only puts the, con uh, uh, the conference in context, will also contribute to all of you sitting here. And uh, that was when it hit me that uh, um, if we, um, what brings us here is the life, right? Is because we are trying to study life, because we are trying to understand whether it exists elsewhere in the universe. And that, that is what we all have in common. And hence the title of my talk, The Unifying Power of Studying uh, and Doing Research on Life. Uh, this logo that you see is the logo of our astrobiology program in University of Hawaii. And, and it just tells you that uh, how the theme of astrobiology and how the study of life can bring different uh, the research together. For instance, uh, you can bring in uh, um, um, Cometary people, cos uh, uh, cosmochemists, and uh, marine biologists, and uh, observers, and all that, um, on their same umbrella. So um, let's get started. Let's let's talk about what life has, what type of feature it has that brings us all here, and how we can put that in the context. So I'm sure you all agree that when I talk about life, I'm referring to earthly life, life as we know it, right? Um, there may be other type of life um, based on other chemicals and other uh, solvents elsewhere in the universe, uh, but we have no way of understanding and knowing that, and the only life that we know is this, and the only life that we can detect, probably, is this life. Now, there is certain um, properties associated with this life, and that is, it has many elements contributing to it. <coughs> um, in its solvent, in its appropriate physiochemical conditions, in its energy, and its, uh, in its elements, in its uh, chemical elements, to get it ignited. And the common denominator of all this is what we call habitability. When an environment, uh, a place where life is supposed to start and, and can start, has these elements, there is a possibility for that um, place to be habitable. <coughs> so, um, to start, you ask, uh, let's, let's take one of these for instance, let's take the solvent part and uh, let's ask ourselves, um, what it, if we want to start research on the solvent part of life, our earthly life, where does it take us and where we end up and whether that will be able to bring all of us together um, or not. So, we believe that the current life as we know it requires water as a solvent. So, your place where life is supposed to start and maintain itself and uh, um, like a habitable planet that you need, it needs to have liquid water. It needs to have liquid water on its surface. So let's just start from here and see where it takes us. You've got to be able to form a planet that has the capability of having water and maintaining it, right? And that opens the new f a field into planet formation, formation of habitable terrestrial planet formation, and the way that this object, this planet, will receive or maintain and maintain uh, their volatiles and water. And that by itself is a, a, a huge field of research. Um, 
This is what I'm showing you here is one example of the type of the study that we do in order to understand how Earth-like planets form and how they, uh, uh, they get their water, how they get their volatiles, and how they maintain it. What you see here is uh, the very late stage of the formation of the inner planets in our solar system where we put um, several hundred objects as big as Moon and Mars uh, in a very orderly manner, um, interior to orbit of Jupiter, and then we uh, submerge them in a huge sea of small kilometer-sized bodies that are sitting back there, and you don't see them. And then we let all these interact with giant planets, with a, uh, with a Sun, and with each other. And then we distribute based on the cosmochemical data and uh, based on the data coming from um, spacecrafts and meeting asteroids and measurements of um, the volatiles uh, throughout the asteroid belt. We distribute the volatiles, some sort of compound, for instance, water, in them. And then we watch how this, the compound and the, for instance, ice water, it gets transferred from one part to the other part. What is the radial mixing and what do we get at the very end? End, right. Um, don't worry that this doesn't, the end product doesn't look like our solar system. This is just to demonstrate the field, the way that that field works and where it is going. But then you ask yourself if this is the beginning of the late stage of the formation of Earth, where did um, all the chemical compounds and, uh, and water come from? If we are assuming that what brought water to Earth was a bunch of uh, asteroids and the big large bodies at the outer part of the solar, uh, outer part of the asteroid belt that provided that, where did they get the volatiles, right? And that opened, the, so you're trying to move one step forward to understand how Earth formed and brought its um, volatiles, and then you gotta go one step side and look into how those primitive bodies that you want to consider as your carriers of volatiles, they brought their, uh, they, they acquired their um, com uh, chemical compounds and their water. And uh, well, I'm just showing here comet 67P, and uh, um, I like this because um, there is a very nice um, a mosaic of all its um, uh, outbursts and the type of elements that have been discovered by Rosetta mission through um, by uh, visiting this comet. And this is uh, <coughs> um, a bunch of pictures uh, from the Rosetta uh, website showing that uh, the mission was uh, capable of identifying many uh, chemical uh, molecules uh, in, this um, in this asteroid, including water paper, CO2 ice, and what I called, or they called, a zoo of other chemical compounds. Uh, the um, principal investigator of uh, Rosina, Catherine Altwick, uh, put this together just to show not only the type of compounds that exist, also um, how weird they are. You expect you go after water, you go after CO2, you go after CO, then you find many other things that uh, you weren't even expecting to find, right? So, like I said, you try to take one step forward to explain the first question, how your habitable planet formed, you gotta take one step side, then that opens up a new field of how this um, building blocks of your habitable planet, they, they gained the chemical compounds and that you have to incorporate into your study. And then you ask yourself, okay, if they, if they got, they have the chemical compounds that you need, they have the volatiles and ice that you need, where did that come from? Now you gotta go another step uh, on the side or forward and that brings you to even prior to the time that the planet formation started to the disk of the nebula, the nebular disk and the um, science of astrochemistry. So you, you, you're a dynamicist, you try to understand formation, you need another field, the field of um, understanding the cosmochemistry to help you and then that also needs another field, the astrochemistry, to help them and that is, as you see, you, you start from one point and it takes you to different places and you'll see where we end up. Uh, it's an uh, interesting journey. 
Uh, this is the image of planet forming disk around the young star V883 um, and the, the beauty of it is that uh, it was measured by, um, uh, it, was, it was observed by ALMA, the beauty of it was that they were able to identify um, a dark ring that corresponds to a snow line. The concept of a snow line is a very important uh, matter to planet formation, especially to the formation of uh, habitable planets because it presents a region beyond which objects can maintain uh, ice permanently. And that can act as a reservoir for bringing in ice and solid um, icy material. <coughs> and um, so the next, well, the next journey would be to, okay, I get, I get the ice. How about CO? How about CO2? How about NH and NH3 and all that? Well, same type of field, same field, astrochemistry, it gives you that as well. A study of disk have been able to um, reveal many chemical compounds, including, for instance, CO, uh, HCO plus uh, in, in the variety of disk. I'm just showing this um, because is interesting and I like it, this ALMA image um, of uh, the star HD 142527 and uh, they were able to discover, to detect, um, as I said, CO and the HCO plus in the disk. So, um, you want to explain how your habitable planet forms, you need another field to help you uh, with the volatile delivery, you need another field to help that one uh, with where the volatiles and the compounds come from, and as you see, but the story doesn't end here. The next story is that your habitable planet has water, and we started from water, and then we got all the way to disks and compounds in disk and the field of astrochemistry. But the story doesn't end there. Your habitable planet, or Earth, has atmosphere, and this atmosphere also has properties. So you ask yourself, where did that atmosphere come from? Was it uh, um, <coughs> attracted from the nebula? Was it primordial, or it was the result of outgassing? Well, well. Um, Again, the field of dynamics will tell you that at the time of the formation, Earth was molten and it cooled down, and as it cooled down, it, it surfaced. Now, now we are getting into another field. We are getting into geology and the interior of Earth and everything. And the uh, surface of Earth cracked, there was outgassing, and that outgassing resulted into a secondary um, atmosphere. And uh, then again, it brings the question that, um, okay, what we see as the chemical structure of the atmosphere must be the signature of what is interior to Earth and what was uh, incorporated into it as Earth was growing. And that takes us to another field, the, the direct interaction between the star and planet that affects the chemical structure and mass of the atmosphere. So it's not like that you have your Earth and is independently is just cooling down and outgasses and you have atmosphere. Just the interaction between Earth and Sun will determine how much of that atmosphere mass will stay, how much of it will go away. What you see here is that depending on whether the central star rotates rapidly or slowly, the flux of EUV, I'm, I'm, I apologize if you don't see that here, the flux of EUV will be different. And that different flux determines how much of the atmosphere gas will stay, how much of it will go away. Uh, for instance, uh, you see one, of, uh, one um, model here which suggests that what, what you see here is the atmospheric mass uh, that indicates if you, ha you are dealing with a fast rotating star, the amount of atmospheric gas that stays is going to be very much different from a slow rotating star. In other words, the rotation of your central star plays an important role in the amount of atmosphere that stays around your habitable planet. So not only you need the geology to tell you the, about the outgassing and all that, the star-planet interaction dictates how much the atmosphere stays. So I, I hope you, you're getting the picture that you start by one single question and then it takes you so many places. I will put all this together and you will see what a big beast is uh, it will become. Um, so the story doesn't end there. Um, then you have um, um, the atmosphere. Atmosphere acts as a, it has a CO2 cycle. The CO2 cycle is deeply connect, connected to geodynamics and interior dynamics of your planet. That plate tectonics plays an important role to cycle material, to introduce CO2, and the CO2 clouds will act as a blanket and that is very important because you need the temperature throughout the planet to stay uniform. Okay, so now 
I started, first I started uh, from the formation, then it took me all the way to a direction about the primordial nebula, and then I went back to the formation and it took me the, to a direction of atmospheric circulation, and then it took me to geology. So you see how they are, they are being uh, connected to one another. <coughs> and finally, um, our life uh, is, uh, requires the magnetic field, or let's put it this way, the magnetic field of Earth has, is very important in order to uh, prevent hazardous material to reach the surface of Earth, uh, which may uh, put our life in danger. That is, again, another part of the interior dynamics that must be um, satisfied for a habitable planet. Okay, so with all this, I'll put this chart up. You ask your question uh, about habitability, and uh, about, you ask question about life, and you want to see how uh, the only habitable planet that we uh, know form and how life came about, and then you end up with this. You open one question, and then all of a sudden you have many other things that you have to answer, and they are all connected together. The unfortunate fact is that it is not that simple. If, if it was only seven boxes, we could deal with it. Uh, I will show you an end of my talk that uh, is much more complicated than that. <coughs> But one interesting thing comes out of this. You know, when you put all these together, one interesting thing comes out of it. And that is how our Earth is habitable and how you can use this habitability concept to apply that to other planetary systems. There is no reason to believe that our solar system is unique. We know that it is not unique. There is no reason to believe that Earth is the only habitable planet and there must be habitable planet elsewhere in the universe, right? But the question is how can you take this concept of habitability and extend it to others and that is done through the definition of habitable zone. All that I told you now puts the habitability of our planet in the context and gives you one quantity, habitable zone, one concept that you can apply to other planetary systems and determine whether they have the potential to develop earthly life. I, the emphasis is on earthly life. Uh, there are a variety of differences for a habitable zone. Uh, um, the most naive way of saying it is that it's a region where the radiation from the central star allows water to stay liquid on the surface. Uh, that is the way that you explain it to a five-year-old kid. You know, to us scientists, it's much more complicated than that. I'm not going to get into details of it, but I'm going to say the habitable zone in a way that can be accepted. Uh, you can put it in, uh, uh, you can teach it to your, to your students is an annulus around the star with a rocky planet, so that's one condition, with a CO2, H2O, N2 atmosphere. You gotta have that because that is earthly life. If there is anything else we don't know, we cannot detect, we don't know what will be the consequence of that. And sufficiently large water content, we need that because we need to have water as a solvent. Also, we need to have water as a lubricant for plate tectonics. And similar geodynamical properties, the plate tectonics can host liquid water on a solid surface. And that has a lot to do with the interaction of the incoming radiation from your star and the chemistry of the atmosphere. Um, I don't have time to go through that, but that is one industry by itself, how you calculate the region, the boundaries of the habitable zone based on the interaction between the molecules and chemical structure of your atmosphere and uh, uh, incoming radiation from a star is an entirely uh, different topic. Now, to extend this to extrasolar planets, we, have, uh, we are in a very good time. We have many of them. We have about three, 4,000 of them. And many of them show the type of characteristic that we are looking after. Um, this shows the mass um, of, in terms of mass Jupiter of planets in ter terms of the orbital distance. And you see a diversity of planets all over the place, right? Now I'm gonna sh put this in the context of the planets discovered with Kepler, and that becomes even much nicer. So that's the, this is the same graph as before. Now you see that we have a lot of planets uh, in, the, in the region of one to four Neptune, Earth to Neptune radii, one to four Earth radii. And I want to draw your attention, oh sorry, I want to draw your attention specifically to this region, one to two Earth radii, especially those planets that have um, two to three Earth masses, those are the ones that are targets of our investigation. Those are the ones that we believe that 
they are good candidates, they are the best candidates to be rocky and work for the masses to be, not to be too large, be at the same range that will um, hopefully will uh, show the same geodynamical behavior as Earth will have probably plate tectonics and uh, it, the mass is not too far from Earth to show its uh, entirely different characteristics uh, but it's close enough to be considered Earth-like. Um, we, we, we actually went after this. Uh, we we uh, took um, about 4,400 4, Kepler um, target stars. We look at all the planets that they have um, and we identified, I will show you a list of that, I, we identified 144 of them that are in the habitable zone with a subset that are rocky. Among them there is this very interesting one, Kepler 186 uh, system that is um, slightly bigger than Earth uh, with a mass close to mass of Earth. So we did that. We took the 4,400 uh, stars from Kepler, we studied their um, habitability, we identified the planet that they have, and we identified planets in the habitable zone. What you see here as the boundary of habitable zone is, uh, is this way. From the, there is an um, optimistic habitable zone starting from what we call recent Venus to early Mars, and there is a, um, a conservative habitable zone that is considered from a runaway greenhouse to maximum greenhouse. And uh, we, like I said, we will, if you're interested, look at that paper up there. Um, it came out this year. It's on AppJ, uh, volume 830. So uh, we were able to identify 144 planets, and that was very promising. And among them, we were able to identify 20 of them with radii smaller than two Earth radii, suggesting that this planet could be um, rocky, and because they are in the habitable zone, if they have the right chemical elements, they probably or they could be put uh, habitable. Okay, so um, that is where we stand now. We started again. Uh, let me remind us what we did. We started by saying that I showed you the picture of the monkey, right? And then I said that well, that is uh, that's life on Earth. Let's see where it takes us. And it took us uh, um, all over the place. Then I put up a chart and I said that well, you see, all these are connected to each other. And then we said, okay, let's put all this in one term, one concept, habitable zone, applied to other planetary systems. Kepler has discovered something like 20 of them, and now there are other missions uh, in the works. Uh, tests uh, will probably find many uh, candidates that can be analyzed and that their spectrum probably can be um, studied by JWST. W first, we have our first uh, meeting tomorrow um, by Vietnam time at midnight, uh, where we are going to uh, study how we can use W first for the purpose of understanding habitability of Earth and other habitable planets, and uh, and of course uh, many others that, that are in the works, and uh, that brings us to one thing. So. Um, we want to explore the possibility of Earth and Earth-like planets elsewhere in the universe, uh, but we have to make sure that uh, we stay within the ethics, norms of ethics, and that uh, we follow um, um, the ethical um, norms of human life, right? I leave this here for you to read it as I say a few words, and then um, I wrap up with um, two or three more slides. So, um, yeah, we will have talks, um, I think it is uh, tomorrow after the coffee break, we'll have some talks uh, about uh, the ethics of doing uh, research on habitable planets and, uh, and its application elsewhere in the universe. And that uh, brings me to this. I started by liquid water, right? And it took me all over the place. I said we have to have a planetary system and that planetary system must have certain orbital uh, evolution. And then I told you that, that you have to have the uh, composition. The composition has to come from the stars and uh, the, which connects you to the galaxies. And all these things, there must be surface, there must be atmosphere, the interior dynamics, and all this put, put it together. But the story doesn't end here. If you look at our Earth, it is tightly bound to moon. That, that has profound effect on the habitability of our planet. It's volatile, we're delivered to it while 
giant planets were there and interacted with the disk of material. There is, there is a lot more in it. As a matter of fact, much, much more. I apologize if you don't, if you don't see these uh, green things, but I can read some of them for you. For instance, uh, uh, the magnetic field, uh, depending on the technology, the rotation rate, the obliquity, the minor planets, the dust in the system, the luminosity, isotope ratios, all that will be. And still, I haven't talked about another thing. I haven't talked about uh, biology. I haven't talked about uh, system chemistry. I haven't talked about when you bring all this and, you, and life gets ignited, what happens next? What we see is the current state. What started was not this. What started was something that we are trying to figure out. We are trying to figure out what was the origin of life. But what we know is that despite the fact that we don't have a knowledge of origin of life, life, no matter how it started, it went through different paths. It went through different bifurcations. Some of them died, some of them stayed, some of them branched out, and what we see now, which requires liquid water as solvent and is carbon-based, is the one that managed to maintain and sustain itself for as long as it did, right? And that I haven't still even talked about. That, that is another entirely different uh, industry. Uh, here, for instance, um, in um, the, the big debate is whether the replication was first or metabolism were, was first. And during the past 10, 20 years, the idea was that by understanding system chemistry and molecular heterogeneity, we are now uh, scientists have been able, scientists of that field have been able to say that this debate is obsolete, it no longer matters. What matters is that all basic molecules co-evolved from the beginning and forming heterogeneity from the beginning in a co-evolution altogether. And it, and it tells you, we started from Earth, and then we found some Earth-like planets with Kepler somewhere else. You start from a, an old debate, then you realize that during the past 10, 20 years with that mass of technology and laboratory studies, that that debate no longer is valid. There is something else in there. So let's go back here, right? I put that, I put that, uh, that the, it's, it's not just one thing, it's not just liquid water that you need to have a habitable planet. You need to have biology, you need to have composition, you need to have interior, and all that. And what study of life does is that it puts all of them under the same umbrella. And my dear friends, that umbrella is called astrobiology. Thank you.